No matter how good a vacuum is, it will always leave some dirt behind, and this is why. A carpet is a complex network of densely packed fibres that can capture particles. Carpets come in all shapes and sizes, and the main differences from the perspective of trap dust are the pile depth, so whether it's a short, medium or deep pile carpet, the pile type, so there are many different kinds of pile weaves such as twist, saxony, shag and so on, the pile density, so both the small and larger scale, i.e. individual fibres and larger structures, and that depends on the pile type as well. The fibre material, so the material the fibres are made from, affects its stickiness to particles of different kinds, and the stiffness of fibres and larger structures, which affects how easily particles can be locked in. Carpet structure can be very complex at a microscopic level, and can act very much like a filter, trapping particles. Dirt and dust particles come in all different shapes and sizes, from hers at the larger scale to microscopic bacteria at the smaller scale. So a vacuum cleaner has to cope with being able to extract particles that range from centimetre sized to submicrometer sized. Most dirt, particularly the larger kind, that lands on a carpet, initially sits on the surface region. This can get trodden down and agitated deeper into the pile over time. There is a limit though to how deep dirt of a particular size can typically go, because fibres get denser deeper down and there's less space for a dirt particle to get into. Dirt near the surface is easy to remove, but deeper down there's more resistance and forces from the fibres trapping dirt better. Removing particles requires airflow and agitation. The vacuum head is at low pressure and thus airflow is generally upwards through the fibres, but there is some sideways flow as well. This airflow moves loose particles that aren't trapped by fibres in the pile. Agitation is achieved in two ways. Firstly, impact from a brush bar striking the pile surface can cause vibrations which can help shake loose some of the trapped particles. These typically move upwards erratically because of reduced resistive forces in that direction where pile density is lower, but not always. Excessive or harsh vibration above a particular level doesn't necessarily cause more particles to move to the surface. Less vibration can achieve the same result and also benefits from reduced noise. Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, spreading the carpet pile elements by dragging the cleaner head and brush bar over them acts to flex and separate fibres, expose the dirt, reduce resistive forces from the pile that gives the carpet its filter effect, and allows the particles to be accelerated into the upwards airflow. Bristles on a brush bar can also directly grab particles and hairs in the top layers. So both good airflow and agitation, including summed vibration, is important to getting good cleaning results. Because the carpet is like a filter causing particle resistance, and dense fibres block dirt particles, removing them becomes a statistical process. This is something many people might not fully appreciate, because it's actually quite a complex physical system and isn't completely intuitive. The statistical nature of particle removal from carpets has some important implications in understanding cleaning performance. Each pass of a cleaner head, with its agitating effects and particle accelerating airflow, will reduce the concentration of particles in the network of fibres, but not to zero. Some particles remain trapped in the complex network of fibres as they're moved by the action of the vacuum cleaner head and get left behind. No matter how good a vacuum is, and even with many passes, there will always be some particles left in the carpet, particularly those deeper down that encounter more resistance in the removal process. It may take many passes, equating to many separate cleaning sessions, to reduce concentration to lower values, which would be classified as clean. The total number of particles removed in a pass is dependent on the number that are there, so the more particles that there are to start with, the more that will be removed in that pass. How much dirt is removed in a pass for a fixed initial particle concentration does depend on the effectiveness and design of the clean head, particularly at lower concentrations. Better performing vacuums achieve a greater particle concentration reduction from a fixed initial concentration in fewer passes. Once dirt is loosened and exposed in the pile, it's the vacuum's suction power that determines the airflow through the pile to remove those particles effectively. Vacuums with weaker suction may struggle to reduce the concentration of dirt that's not near the surface. Incidentally, airwatts have become more often marketed as the be and end-all of vacuum performance metrics, but it's actually the airflux density through the pile which is relevant. 
the number of erwatts per meter square through the pile. It represents the magnitude of those available erwatts actually doing any work, accelerating exposed particles out of the fibre network. Airflow, and thus the number of erwatts, can be leaked in poor design and not pass through the pile, but the airflux density through the pile accounts for that. But it's probably too technical a parameter for marketing though really. Deep cleaning is equivalently achieved with repeated normal cleaning sessions, given good suction, which reduces deeper particle concentration in a stepwise fashion. But of course, particles are always being reintroduced in daily living, increasing the concentration in the carpet. So there's a continuous flux of particles to and from a carpet, and it'll never be without some dirt. Vacuum cleaning is all about keeping dirt to a range of minimal acceptable concentrations. Understanding the statistical nature of particle removal and the filter-like nature of carpets has some important consequences for how you should view and interpret various YouTube videos showing home user tests. While these tests may be well-meaning, they can often be quite contrived and exaggerated, and thus rarely represent how well a vacuum would clean a home under real-world conditions. It's actually not accurate to judge a vacuum's performance during intended usage by looking at how it copes with exaggerated messes, as unintuitive as that might sound, and this is a natural consequence of the statistical nature of particle removal from this kind of system. It's incorrect logic to claim that if a given vacuum cleans an exaggerated carpet mess well, at least visually, then it will automatically clean a lesser, normal mess equally well, or better, because the mess is less severe. This demonstrates a misunderstanding of the statistical nature of particle removal from this kind of system. Any vacuum will always remove lots of particles when the concentration is high, such as in exaggerated messes, and therefore will visually look like a good performer. Starting a test with lots of dirt just puts you higher on the concentration curve, well outside normal levels. Any vacuum can easily remove lots of dirt in that case, simply because there's lots of freely available dirt to remove. When the concentration is lower, and is more representative of the levels of dirt in normal household daily messes, a vacuum may struggle to successfully extract those last relatively few particles trapped in the fibres that aren't as freely available, particularly if it has poor suction. Achieving the very lowest concentration of particles in the pile, i.e. getting the best performance and cleaning results, requires good vacuum cleaner design and optimal use of the available suction. The best vacuums can reduce concentrations to the lowest levels, and that's much harder to visually show, and certainly not via an initially big mess. Vacuums are tuned for normal concentrations of dirt because that's what they encounter in everyday use, and so may not be good at removing so much dirt effectively, even though they're good at achieving the very lowest concentrations under normal mess levels. So big mess tests only really have value as visual entertainment, although they can be used to test filtration quality under accelerated usage, but that's getting a bit off topic and rarely done correctly on YouTube anyway, unfortunately. So this also explains where the term whoever vacuums last wins comes from. Vacuuming reduces particle concentration, but not immediately to near zero, and even the best vacuum will leave particles behind. Going over a second time with the same or even a different vacuum will always extract additional particles, albeit less of them. So when you see people vacuuming over an area that's just been vacuumed, using a different cleaner, and concluding the first cleaner missed a lot, and thus the second cleaner is better, you know they've fallen victim to a misunderstanding of the statistical process of particle extraction from a carpet. You can only accurately compare performance between vacuums by testing from the same initial conditions, i.e. concentration, particle size distribution, and particle distribution within the pile on a similar carpet. Any other test is just not comparing apples with apples. Ultimately, only industry standard testing is relevant because that is done formally and rigorously to set standards, and I'll discuss this in another video. No matter how good or convincing they may look, bedroom YouTube tests are just not good enough to conclude anything meaningful about a given vacuum's performance. Don't be fooled by YouTube demonstrations that try to show how good or bad a given vacuum cleaner is. At best, they're just for entertainment, and at worst, they can, unfortunately, be a form of propaganda. Many more factors really should be considered in a good vacuum other than just its cleaning performance, such as filtration quality, maintenance requirements, ease of use, power consumption, running costs, and so on. It's the holistic performance that's often most important. So the important takeaway message from this video is that carpets are filters that trap dust. 
Cleaning relies on a high flux density of air and pile agitation, mostly by pile separation, assisted by some vibration. You'll never remove all of the dirt, even with many passes. Better vacuum designs reduce normal level dirt concentrations by a greater amount per pass and achieve the lowest concentrations in the carpet. Exaggerated messes are not representative of real world performance. It's wrong to think that if a vacuum performs well with a big mess, that it'll perform well with a lesser mess. It's actually harder to perform well when concentration is lower in nearer normal, daily, real world levels. Performance can only ever really be accurately determined by formal industry standard testing, so don't be fooled by YouTube tricks, no matter how convincing they might look. In reality, it's always more complicated than people make out, and that includes me in this video.